Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. On today's special program, we review what the Lord has done through our ministry this year. We are so thankful you've joined us today. I am David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. Jeffrey Seif. Well, it's another year that we have been sitting at this table together. Dr. Seif, I can't believe we're at the end of 2022. It's been a good year for us. I don't know about you. Well, yes, it's been great sitting here, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of our friends that sit there and are interested in what we have to share. They yes. do. Uh, all of you make this happen, and we're in a season of thankfulness, so of course we're thankful for our viewers. We're thankful for you. Tell us real quick, I know you have a new degree in 2022, right? Well, the Lord graced, I pressed through COVID, and went back and forth to England many times, and finished up a degree from Cambridge University, and I'm, I'm pleased about that. Now I'm pivoting again uh, to go at it again, another five-year journey at Cambridge, but uh, I like to keep learning. I think the, uh, the best teachers are, are students themselves, so. Something I'm so thankful for, our second time to Israel this year, Hallelujah, it's been a while, but we're back. It's all opening up again, isn't it? People are going to visit, you know, COVID is kind of receding into the background and uh, um, I'm pleased about that. And we just got back from our first tour back yes. from COVID. You know, we, we, we filmed there a couple times, you were just there recently, and we brought our first tour group to the Holy Land. We just didn't know if that would be something that we'd do ever again. Right. So yeah. incredibly thankful. Yes. To look back on this year, and we started out this year with the series about King David, right? You taught that to us. Well, it was called The Warrior King, and I was interested in David-like leadership for Goliath-like times. I think we need strong leadership, we need biblical leadership, and I like taking a look at the book, the good book, and looking at a great leader therein, David. That's good. Right now, let's look at some excerpts from that program. place that I wasn't planning on taking you to. I wasn't planning on being here myself. I didn't know about this place a week ago. Came here to Israel to shoot a series called The Warrior King on David. Little did I know that in conjunction with our arrival and filming, we would have one of the greatest modern discoveries in the history of biblical archaeology. I know it sounds overstated, but it isn't. Articles are appearing on major uh, Israeli periodicals, uh, on the internet, right here, the northeastern hills of Elah, in the ruins of Kaifa, we have a fortress that dates back 1000 BC. Now what makes this find striking, and I'm coming to you from the middle of it, what makes it striking is the fact that right here, very recently unearthed were the oldest Hebrew scripts found to date, predating the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls by almost a millennia. I think it's a great story. Uh, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, you know, when I grew up, I thought his father and mother were Mr. and Mrs. Christ. Then I was reminded that actually Christ itself is a Greek telling of the Hebrew Mashiach, Messiah. And the word Messiah itself comes from a word in Hebrew, anointed one. And why is that? Because in the uh, Torah, there were individuals that when they came to office, they were anointed, prophets, priests, and kings. And they were anointed with oil. And here we are in an oil-making factory, just like it was in Bible days. And here, the olives are put in and they're ground down. There's a number of grinding down processes to get the fruit of the olive. They put the olives under pressure. 
It was a surprise attack, and the knight belonged to David. In all the land of Israel, there was no one who could stand against God's anointed one. No sword or weapon devised by man could defeat us. And the Philistines fled into the night. Behind me is the Valley of Elah, a place where David uh, sparked a revolution, if you will, for the longest. Uh, Israelites were oppressed, so-pressed, repressed, depressed, and impressed with the need that something needed to change. And why was that? Because the Pilistim were working havoc over here. And not just the Philistines here, but different steams at different places. And people were afraid. They, they were ready for a change, if you will. Talk about we need change. Well, they really wanted it. They needed it. And the time was right. Someone needed to stand up with some faith and some biblical faith. A lot of people have a lot of ideas about what needs to happen in the world, but you know what? Finally, someone stood up with God's idea. And I love him for his so doing, and by virtue of his so doing, David left a mark on biblical literature, not only in his own day, but extended for a thousand years later. It all started here. What a fitting place to, to tell the story of the needing to contend and war, if you will, for God's sake. For us, for the most part, the implications are spiritual more than material, but we need to recover that radical edge. And I want to talk to you about that edge as we look at the warrior king and we consider the need for David-like leadership in these Goliath-like times. That was an excerpt from our series, Warrior King. Dr. Seif, thank you so much for your teaching on that. Brilliant as always. Well, you're kind, but the story's in the book, in the Bible, and uh, goodness, you know, the times were precarious, and it's great to see God's man emerge. We saw it yesterday. Uh, I'd like to see it today, too. We have uh, so many things that you bring to light that are from the Old Testament that are current to our lives now, and we also have so many things on our website, levitt.com that are bringing the old to new. If you, uh, you have missed any of our series, you are welcome to go on levitt.com 24 seven. Even if you can't watch our program on your television, you can watch old series, you can watch the current ones. We also have something that is wonderful that I kind of discovered looking on our website the other day. It's called LLX. So LL is our Levitt letter, monthly publication that we send out. But if you want timely, up-to-date, current events happening in Israel, get on our website. There's all kinds of information. You can buy books. You can buy our series. Gosh, I could, I could go on and on about our website. One of our series that we brought you this last year is about Jeremiah. Let's go to an excerpt right now about his life. In the sixth century BC, one man stood alone against the pervading wickedness of God's people in the land of Judah. The prophet Jeremiah was chosen by the Lord to warn of pending judgment that would come at the hands of the Babylonians. Visions of an exile left him heartbroken and in tears. But Jeremiah remained faithful to his calling and recorded a message that would speak to generations yet to come. Standing tall with faith in God, he understood better days were coming. And there was hope over the horizon. It was a tough message. Jeremiah explained what he meant by it. He was explicit in his prophetic inventory. If you look at the first 24 chapters of Jeremiah, it's an anthology. Uh, Baruch has assembled his scribe, his helper, uh, his messages that were put to print and read and then destroyed and then put to print again. He wasn't a popular fellow, to be sure. People turned on him. And you can understand why he did not have a happy, clappy message. His word was repent or else. What was lacking in the world? Truth, justice, and righteousness. 
that was his day. But can I just ask you the question rhetorically, isn't that so much like our own day as well? You can pick up a newspaper, or listen to a radio, watch television to get the news, but the news is colored by all kinds of hues. The coloration of it sometimes obfuscates the story. That is, it blurs it, it hides it. And I don't know today if we can trust across the board that our news really is giving us the news, but rather it's giving us political views driven by particular agendas. And what about justice? We hear justice for this person, justice for that. Justice is a really good thing. And I believe we should stand for it. And I believe we should decry injustice. There should be no place for it. If you look at our founding documents and our culture, that there's a premium on justice for all. And that should be held inviolate. But quite frankly, I'm not sure that justice today itself or the language of what's just, equitable and fair isn't succumbing to all kinds of political intrigue with the net result that there's injustice that is parroted in the name of justice. Jeremiah has been a faithful servant of the Lord. The message given to his people Judah had largely gone unheeded, recorded for many years by his devoted scribe Baruch. But while the prophetic message had led to Judah's exile, there was a better day coming. There was still hope over the horizon. יום אחד כבשים יראו על גבעות אלה שוב. על גבעות אלה ממש. וכמו כן בצפון ובדרום. ורואים ינהיגו אותן. And that's the gospel truth. That is to say that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him irrespective of past sins and circumstance, whoever, irrespective, would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the Newer Testament version of the story. Here in Jeremiah, he's explicit that God will raise up unto David, through him, I should say, this messianic deliverer, and through him, people will be saved, all people. When I look in Jeremiah's world, there's tough stories there, but he sees beyond it, and he knows, indeed, there's hope over the horizon. Hope you enjoyed those highlights from our Prophet Jeremiah series. There are some harsh words that Jeremiah had for the nation of Israel, but there was always hope. It, hope, was, hope, a hope. it was a tough moment politically. It was a tough moment spiritually. He spoke to the moment, but he spoke beyond the moment. That's the genius of Jeremiah. It is, and the genius of this program is the fact that we can take you to the Holy Land and you can see the restored Israel that Jeremiah talked about. It's incredible. Yes, and for those that don't go with us to the land, uh, we can show it to you through the media that is television. I want to thank you for those of you that help us get that job done. I mention that because if it wasn't for you, sitting there and caring and sharing, we wouldn't be sitting here caring and sharing as well, and thank you for that. Me, I think, uh, 67 years of age, one of the benefits, and I'm oftentimes reminded of the problems associated with age, one of the benefits is kids are grown up, house is paid for, I'm not as worried about paying the bills as I was when I was 30, 40, and 50. 
there's a few extra dollars to spend and I like investing it. If you're like me and find value in what we do, please invest in the kingdom through our Jewish roots and do it today. I know it's not good to have favorite series, but I've got to say one of my favorite series this year was Much Like Peter. I think it's because we were able to go to Israel, sing together on the Sea of Galilee. We had dramatic reenactments that were filmed there on the Sea of Galilee, and Dr. Seif's teaching was so good. Let's see some highlights from that program right now. Sunrise on the Galilee. Simon Peter prepares his nets for a day at sea. Much like the sea, Peter is unpredictable, calm and steady. And then, in an instant, tempestuous. As we reflect upon the Lord's most intriguing disciple, we can see ourselves because we too have been broken and then restored. We too, in so many ways, are much like Peter. ברגע שהוא אמר, אל תפחדו, אני ידעתי שזה האדון. הוא הרי ציווה שקט על המים האלה בעבר, אז חייב שזה יהיה הוא. ואז שהוא אמר, בוא, אני... אני לא היססתי, אני פשוט... אני פשוט יצאתי. שוב גברה עליך כניעה חסרת מעצורים. כיפת, אתה למעשה הלכת על פני המים. על אף הרוח והגלים, אתה עשית זאת. כן, אבל כשהתקרבתי אליו, אני נזכרתי בגלים, נבהלתי מהרוח החזקה ו... ואיבדתי ריכוז. בוא, התחלתי לשקוע. אז הוא הרים אותי ושאל אותי מה קרה לאמונתי, מדוע היה בי ספק. מאדה צ'אחו אומרת שהם היו באמת בעיה, ורחוק מהמים, למשל, וברס 24 אנחנו אומרים שהם היו הרבה זמן מהמים. הרבה מהמים, הרבה מהמים, הרבה מהמים. Stady in antiquity harks to a term about 600 feet. We're looking at two football fields, and there were many stadia out. They were in a, they were in a bad way. They were in trouble. Uh, the sea was storm-tossed, and uh, these were hardened fishermen. You know, they could handle tough terrain in the water, but, but they were far out, and it was the middle of the night, you know, uh, 3 to 6 a.m. They did what the Lord told them to do, but they sailed into trouble. Uh, we're told in verse 25, then the fourth watch of the night, Again, this is using uh, terms in antiquity, 3 to 6 a.m. Yeshua came to them walking on the sea, according to the story. Fascinating. And they cried out with fear. It, it, you know, the Bible speaks of fear. You are out annoyed. It's reverence. This is panic. It's not reverence. They're, they're, they're already in a bad way because of their circumstances. But now <laughs> things seem to have gotten worse. We're, we're, we're looking at a snapshot here. We're looking at a moment in uh, the disciples' experience with Yeshua, where something very significant happened. Uh, we see Yeshua appearing in a flash of heavenly light. We see uh, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu Moses and Eliyahu uh, there with him. There's a kind of congruence here between the Testament stories. Uh, there's a credence here, uh, that is, that Yeshua is the one of whom they spoke. There's a kind of connectivity here. Uh, there is, uh, they're pointing to him, and here they are conversing with him. Yeshua told the disciples to go into all the world, but they didn't go. Sometimes there's a chasm between the rhetoric and the reality. I mention that because to get Peter to go into all the world, God had to come and get him. You know the story, we recounted it earlier, that a vision comes to him, a blanket uh, with all kinds of animals in it that he doesn't eat. Eat, Pete is the word, and this goes back and forth three times. We're told in Acts uh, chapter uh, 10, verse 19, that he's mulling his vision around, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 he hears a knock on the door. 
and some messengers show up. It's rather interesting. And they have a word for Peter in verse 22. They say, Cornelius. These are dispatches from Cornelius who had sent them to Peter to get him to come and talk to him. Uh, Cornelius, we're told, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by all the Jewish people, was directed by an angel for us to come and get you. Coming from this place and coming from this book that, was, uh, that tells the story of this place. Oh, friends, I think of the grace of God that is so very big and it extends to sinners like me and you and like those people that perform poorly in our webs of relationships. Oh, in so many ways, we're all much like Peter. Inasmuch as God gave Peter a break, would that we would do the same for the Peters in our own world. The Peter series, in my opinion, is spectacular, is just gorgeous uh, visually also. But I think what our people don't see is you had to battle some rain, didn't you, and some wind. And <laughs> You can't control the environment. You know, here we're in the studio. You can control lights and sounds. You just got to work with it out there. Happily, we have a great crew. And, uh, yeah. In America, you know, one of our guys, Bill Elliott, uh, does contract work with National Geographic. He's been in worse environments and learned to manage it. And between the crew that we bring to Israel and the crew that works with us there, it's, it's straight up good team that we can make it happen irrespective of the weather. Right, and we have a good team behind the scenes that also run all of our social media sites. Uh, they're quiet, they're not on camera all the time, but if you are looking to find out what is currently happening in Israel, to watch our programs, we are all over social media. Yes. Dave, where are we? Um, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Rumble, Instagram, Vimeo, Daily Motion. Just have to go to Our Jewish Roots, and we'll be there. Yeah, we're all over. <laughs> Something on uh, YouTube especially that kind of, should I say, caught fire was our standalone program all about the red heifer. And people are watching it probably as we speak, they're watching it. And we wanted to give you a little uh, tidbit and insight into what everybody is watching on YouTube. Here's some of our red heifer program. עד עכשיו עשינו סיבור ראשוני. להגיד לכם מה... רגע, הרב עזריה גם עלה. הרב עזריה פה? דבר בשם מצוות נציאת הפרה האדומה, שכל הכוונותינו יהיה לשם שמיים, ושנצליח במעשה ידינו. I'm uh, ecstatic of uh, what, what they heard. Uh, and we're hoping today, we just said, said a small prayer, we just said now, we're hoping that uh, God will help us inspect and find the, the right red heifer, if it's one, if it's two, if it's many, as many. So we just uh, are, are about now to do the inspection. And the inspection begins. According to Numbers chapter 19, a red heifer must be without defect or blemish, nothing, and must have never been placed under a yoke. Well, these rabbis from Israel used the Mishnah, an ancient oral collection of Jewish traditions. And with those in mind, they meticulously inspect the hairs of the heifer to be precise. Not only must the cow be pure and red, but it cannot contain more than two hairs of a different color. Imagine that. The cow has to be at least three years old, never haltered, and never impregnated. These qualifications have made the search for a perfect red heifer a near impossibility throughout history. And then there's today. There's a group of rabbis that have come from Israel to find the perfect red heifer. And that matters because they want to build the third temple. They believe that if they build the third temple, the Messiah will come. But that can't start until they find a cow, a red heifer without blemish. And then they want to kill it, um, burn its ashes, mix its ashes from the springs of the Gihon Springs. That would be the closest spring to the temple. And then uh, with a special hyssop, 
sprinkle the water on the people at the ceremony, and then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon the people, and that's the beginning of the construction of the Third Temple. These are, these are the blueprints of, of the uh, field school. You see over here, uh, this is the hill that's, that's right uh, behind us with the one-to-one uh, -one scale of the temple and the altar inside of it. And when we're building over here the model, you have to realize this is not just a, a small version of it. This is actually one-to-one -one scale of the same temple which was in, in Jerusalem uh, 2,000 years, which stood there. We're talking about a, a, a building which is about 20 stories high. Just the altar itself is five meters and uh, it's, it's a humongous task. It's, a, it's an unbelievable uh, task to undertake. And we plan to build it over here in this mountain. You can see over here the blueprints for the altar itself. This is obviously the main, the main part of the work of the field school because this is where most of the work of the priests took place, was on the altar itself. Let, let me translate what he said. He said that we think we found, we think we found already. This ministry does Israel. This ministry does prophecy, looking at cattle making their way to Israel. Some don't see much in it, but there's indeed something to it because before the temple is reconstructed, there needs to be a special sacrifice with a red heifer, according to Jewish religious authorities. And we're seeing they made their way to Israel. We love bringing you the news. We think there's something special in this, and I trust you agree. Right, five made it to Israel safe and yes. sound, right? They're just looking for one. They got some extras. <laughs> They're going to enjoy those five. They're going to live a nice life right yeah. now, I think. <laughs> and we just want to say thank you to all of you that make this program happen. You kept us on the air for this year, for 2022. We did it. We made it through. And thank you for everything that you did and all the year. teaching. Well, the real heroes are the ones we don't see. I get to sit here on the set with you guys and stand in Israel and you sing there. But we do it because you do it. Thank you for, for helping us. The whole gospel story spreads because people care to share. Approaching the end of the year, please dig a little deep and help us get into next year. We surely would appreciate it. And I believe that you will be blessed for so doing. And it's time to go now. We leave you with a song from our founder, Zola Levitt, and also a word from the scripture. Sha'alu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.